Please press the red button, says Guzman, a semi-new correctional officer, CO, at Sentinella State Prison. Guzman had been here a few months now. He still hadn't gotten comfortable enough to smile at us, the inmates' loved ones. That was normal for CEOs. Only time would tell if they would ever get comfortable enough to treat us decent. It's a cold Saturday morning, mid-January. The drive out to Sentinela State Prison, where my husband Alex is an inmate, is about an hour and a half. On this day, I'm alone. Accompanied only by a few casinos along the way, mountains, and boulders of all sizes. The taller, more extravagant mountains display fresh, frosty peaks. I'm thrilled to see my husband. My heart is racing, and although it's chilly, my palms are sweaty. I always experience these feelings on the way to any of the three prisons I visited him in the nine years he's been incarcerated. As I reach the visitor processing center doors at the prison, all I have with me is my mandatory see-through baggie, in my mandatory see-through baggie is my ID, one key, money, and my wedding band. I am hungry, sleep-deprived, and anxious. I think it's around 9.30 because of the rising temperature. My pinched nerve is already irritated and throbbing as a result of the 100-yard walk from my car. Physical therapy hadn't helped my sciatica much. I'm practically disabled. Please, please be green, I say to myself softly. When a person gets to the counter, they press a red button, and it randomly lights up red or green. Everyone must press the button upon reaching the counter. Red light means 10 minutes of secondary inspection, a swab from your palm or ID to look for drug residue. It's just a waste of time, so that the prison can say they're being thorough and get more funding from the government. In the two years I visited this place, not once have I seen anyone get detained because of that machine. Red, please step into the other line, Guzman says. Here goes nothing, I sigh to myself as I look down and pretend to kick rocks. After about 10 minutes, I am cleared. Finally, I can get through the metal detectors and be on my way, I think to myself excitedly. I'm confident this time they aren't going to have a snarky or rude comment. Naive indeed, because they always did, especially the female COs. However, my outfit was practically monastery approved. I'm wearing a red skirt that runs down mid-calf, a loose black and white striped shirt with laces to make the top less revealing when needed. It's long enough to cover my lower back curves. But just in case, I always have a duffel bag with up to three safe shirt outfits sitting in my car. I'm sorry, ma'am, your shirt is too form-fitting, says Lopez, the female CO, while inappropriately motioning the curves of my upper body. Mind you, I had worn this very shirt many times to visit my husband. You need to go back out and change, says Lopez. Lopez had seen me at least every other weekend for some months now. This was one of my safe shirts. I'm speechless. Her face is flat with an odd evil bob to it. I rub my leg trying to comprehend what's happening and trying to relieve some of the leg pain with no success. But I always wear this shirt, I say. You need to change, she says. As her her face is frozen in a way in which I can only describe as odd and evil. When Lopez spoke, she also tilted her head. It was unsettling. <laughs> what if I keep my sweater on the whole time? I try to bargain. Her attitude did not change. You need to clear inspection without your sweater. You need to change. I give up. Defeated, I grab my belongings from the counter and limp my way back out to my car. I'm not their only victim. On several occasions, I've seen how they harass the elderly. Mothers and grandmothers who dress conservative are sent to change their unrevealing clothing. After an excruciating hundred yards to my car 
and another agonizing 100 yards back, I get into the third line where people who change must press the red button. Please press the red button, signals Guzman again. Oh my God, not again. I wind in my head, green, oh thank God. I cheer to myself excitedly. I am one step closer to seeing my husband. Okay, step back, he nods to himself. Turn around, good. Now you can put your shoes in the bin, he says as he start, starts counting my dollar bills. Only 50 single dollar bills are allowed per adult visitor for rejected microwavable food and overpriced drinks. Food you can purchase for you and your inmate while visiting. Microwavables you can usually find at your local dollar store. No one had ever counted my money, so that seemed a little odd, but I was pretty sure there was about $50 in that stack. Guzman looks up at me, bothered, holds up a few bills. You have $53. The maximum is 50. Look. He turns to Lopez, the female CO, who had made me change, and says, she has more than the max. She can't, right? 50's a max? Oh, I'm so close, so close. This is unreal. I clench my fist while I make sure my face remains blank and unreadable. Honestly, $50 for a five hour visit with your loved one is never enough. And if you're lucky like me, the machine likes to take your $8 and not give you the barbican bundle of the not so popular cheese and ham hot pocket and a bean and cheese burrito. Of course, I wouldn't be receiving my re refund for two or three weeks after hounding the vendors. I know the drill all too well. Believe me when I tell you, having an extra $3 would not make a difference. Ma'am, you need to take the $3 back to your car, Guzman says as he tries handing me the money. I step back. I'm sorry, but I am not going back to my car and back into that red line. I physically cannot. I say desperately, trying not to panic. Just keep them. At this point, I have drawn unwanted attention from every single person in the building. The room is quiet. Even the children are silent. I can't keep your money. You need to take the money back to your car, he says as he steps forward and places the money in my motionless body. I snap out of my daze, look around, and notice a trash can. I limp over to it and drop the $3 in the bin. Not aggressively, just simply. I'm sorry, ma'am. There cannot be any currency in the trash. You need to take it out, he says. What the hell? At this point, I'm pissed. I take a deep breath and slowly turn and face the 30-plus people in the line behind me. Some watching me quietly and others immediately pretend to look around embarrassed. I lift the extra few dollars and say, does anyone want $3? God forbid you already have 50 though. A woman I just met who had held the door for me as I limped my way in, steps out of the line, raises her hand and sympath sympathetically says, I'll take them. I sigh thankfully and reply, thank you again. As if the universe is testing my patience, I turn around and again I'm facing Guzman and Lopez, the two COs who had tortured me for what seemed like an eternity. And the female CO says to me in the sweetest, most angelic voice, while her face shows no sympathy, you understand? In that instant, I'm convinced she's evil. I desperately want a valid excuse to lose my self-control and lunge at her exposed throat. This was it. At the very least, my tongue would not be contained. No, I don't understand. Your uniform is more revealing than anyone else's attire in this line, I say as I point at the people behind me. I see the way 85% of the COs look at us, look at the inmates and us. You dehumanize us. And let me remind you, my husband is a criminal, but I am not. 
I live in the same playground as you, free to move around as I please. The way you treat me and order me around varies by your mood. You may look down on me because you have a badge or you think you're better than me for some reason. But let me tell you something. The multimillionaire retired PhD I work for thinks the world of me. The elementary school children I teach look up to me. But you, I look her up and down, dehumanize me. I'm sorry, what was it you wanted me to understand? I ask as I stand there barefoot and exposed, waiting for reaction or anything. She's motionless, staring at me for a few moments with no emotion. Someone in the line sneezes and suddenly she drops her stare. Ma'am, you can go through the metal detector now, she says as she walks my belongings to the machine. I will not accept being mistreated. I'm not the type of Christian who turns the other cheek. Alex, on the other hand, was labeled violent for being gang affiliated. But after nine years in prison, he has mastered the Christian practice of turning the other cheek. What kind of screwed up game are they playing anyway? The let's try to push them over the edge so that we can arrest them too game? My belongings and I clear the metal detectors. I am finally free to walk the final 75 yards to where my husband, Alex, is without a doubt impatiently biting his nails off, wondering why I'm so late. After the panic and adrenaline rush I had just experienced, the pain in my leg and the distance to where he is is no barrier. As I walk in, it's already 11.15. I look around and suddenly my sour mood is dissolved. Alex, the once bald-headed tough gangster, now stood next to our designated table with a full set of hair and nerdy glasses, anxious and excited as he notices me walk in. Seeing his relieved face and in his strong embrace, I forget everything I had just encountered. I hold him, and for that moment, we're not surrounded by strangers and bitter COs. It's just him and me. After a brief moment, a CO clears his throat and says, all right, that's enough, Hernandez. Break it up before I write you up. My husband drops his embrace, takes my hand, and leads me to the table. Baby, I was so worried about you. You're, no, you're never more than 15 minutes past your appointment time, he says as he strokes the top of my hand, making sure I'm really here. I pictured you in the mountains with a flat tire, his eyes never leaving the table and his hand never letting go of mine. I could see worry returning to his face as he recalls the very probable thought. Well, I'm here now. Let's forget about it and go get our bargain deal. I've been thinking about that burrito and hot pocket all morning. He laughs as I stand up and pull him along with me to the vending machines. All is forgotten. We're on a date. It's just him and me.